Greenberg Consulting, and many of you may have run across Kent's name already in the past. For sure, it's hard to find a topic worth advocating for in the city and not to find Kent's name um, advocating in one direction or another um, around that. He has certainly become one of Toronto's leading urbanists and Canada's leading urbanist, and as such, actually one of Canada's leading exports. Um, he keeps on also offering opinions and advocating for uh, urbanism in the, in the States and many other, other places. If you're curious about reading intimate details about his life, I suggest you pick up a copy of Walking Home. Um, it's actually an amazing read, not just about uh, urbanism, about city building, it's also about the history of Toronto, most recently, and some of the key decisions that he made over time. Uh, and if, if that wasn't enough to keep him entertained, uh, recently he was part of establishing and founding the City Building Institute with the Ryerson uh, University, where he launched a series of new programs and, and new initiatives. So join me in welcoming Ken on the stage. Thank you. Antonio, and uh, thanks to the TSA for this invitation and for hosting this evening on such an important topic. Um, I think the one thing we can all agree on is that this is an incredibly important decision for our city. And what I want to do is to um, do exactly what Antonio suggested, which is to draw back um, the immediacy of the decision and talk about its impact on shaping our city and what the consequences of, of going one way or another would be. Um, the context for this is that for the last decades, really since the middle of the 20th century, the Toronto waterfront, really around the whole northern edge of Lake Ontario, but let's say specifically from Mimico to the Scarborough Bluffs, has been going through an extraordinary transformation. Arguably the most significant transformation of its kind in North America and perhaps in many parts of the world. Um, I think all of us who live here take this for granted, but the the scope of this change is truly extraordinary, and what you see on the bottom is a three-dimensional model that Waterfront Toronto um, keeps up to date, showing uh, all of the current work that's that's going on in the waterfront. Um, the Ken, sorry, I think I yeah. can't hear you. Oh. Back, if you can speak closer to If anybody can't hear, just oh. lift up your hand. Is that better? Okay. All right. Thank you. Now I have to do this so I can see and talk at the same time. Um, this transformation is in many ways has been guided by a set of core values that were articulated by our former mayor, David Crombie, uh, when he set up and was head of the Waterfront Regeneration Trust. And it was, it was um, kind of uh, the model of clean, green, accessible to all summarize the main goals of this trust. This was in response to what had been happening prior to the creation of this trust. There was a lot of disappointment, as people probably know, with the <coughs> early days of Harborfront, some of the uh, development that was starting to create the so-called wall of condos, uh, which seemed piecemeal and seemed as if it was going to disconnect the population from the waterfront. And David Crombie, in setting up the Waterfront Regeneration Trust, really reached out to a broader kind of ecosystem thinking about the waterfront, uh, which was not only the narrow band of land along Lake Ontario, but all the rivers, the creeks, the watercourses, the recharge area, and the Oak Ridges Moraine, 
uh, really getting people to understand the importance of the hydrology and the presence of nature in our city region that was coming to a kind of crescendo as, as we approached the Toronto waterfront. So in, in the process of this change, we have all lived through a transformation which is quite extraordinary, which is going on until today. So here are two Google Earth snapshots, 2002, 2013, so quite recent. And even in that period of 11 years, um, the change is extraordinary. You see the 200 acres of the railway lands, north of Lakeshore Boulevard, uh, south of Front Street, um, City Place has just emerged in that period. Um, all of the development that's occurred along the waterfront that you see in this image um, has, has been nothing short of extraordinary. And in recent years, um, this has been guided by what is regarded in world terms as one of the best waterfront development agencies, the best one run waterfront development agencies on the planet, and that is Waterfront Toronto, which was set up for a failed Olympic bid, but nonetheless got three levels of government working together, which they continue to do to this day, uh, with a board and uh, responsive to all three levels of government and extremely responsive to the public in guiding this change. So now I want to introduce the new ingredient here, which is the decision about expanding the airport. And I would argue that this entire multi-decade and the multi-generational effort is under threat should this go ahead. And it's not about one thing. It's not about noise, it's not just about traffic, <coughs> it's not just about marine exclusion zones or any of the individual factors one might isolate. It's about the cumulative impacts of all of those things at a scale that threatens to unsettle the balance of factors that's been achieved in the waterfront evolution. That <coughs> impelled me and some key collaborators, Anne Golden, the former head of the Conference Board of Canada of the United Way, and, and well known to many of you, uh, David Crombie himself, Paul Bedford, Jack Diamond, certainly well known to this group. We were really concerned about this, and we got together and we wrote a series of editorials uh, that appeared op-ed pieces that appeared in all of the major newspapers. And what we were arguing, essentially, is that the extent of the change that's proposed for the airport is not incremental. It is, it's not just <coughs> a change at the margin. It actually is a change in kind. It becomes, this airport becomes something different not a marginal increase in what it is today, but it turns into a different creature. And one of the ways of understanding that is this comparison at the same scale of the Ottawa International Airport and the airport we have here at Billy Bishop. And you can see in this image, if you were to project the Ottawa Airport represented by those two lines, um, it would extend well to the east of Young Street and to the west of Ontario Place and pretty far up into the fabric of the city and uh, proposing to handle roughly the same amount of traffic that the Ottawa International Airport handles. So I, I think you can understand uh, with that the difference that this makes. Now there is a so-called environmental assessment which is going on now. And I say so-called quite deliberately. Uh, this was announced uh, in April 2014 by Port Toronto. The problem with this environmental assessment or uh, pretending to be environmental assessment is it is different from what we expect of environmental assessments in many key respects. Port Toronto 
is the proponent on behalf of its major tenant, which derive, from which it derives most of its revenue. So if ever there were a conflict, uh, you have it there. Um, this is uh, a situation where the proponent has actually hired all the consultants to study not alternatives to the undertaking, but how the undertaking can be accommodated. So this environmental assessment really should be regarded as a what we would typically think of as a developer hiring consultants to propose a project to be evaluated uh, by the government. So again, pursuing the differences with what an environmental assessment would normally be, there is no undertaking that has been identified like dealing with air traffic for the region. Um, in fact, this is one solution in search of a problem. There is one foregone conclusion, which in effect is being self-assessed by the proponent itself. Uh, then there's a very fundamental problem with the sequencing of this. Even when the plans that Port Toronto and its consultants um, do appear and are appearing, their conclusions regarding the configuration of the runways, marine exclusion zones, sound barriers, all critical factors in determining what the impacts would be, are at best a hypothesis until Transport Canada weighs in. And Transport Canada does not provide any definitive direction on any of these things until all the plans are completed. It doesn't, in other words, it is not making its conclusions available during the study phase. So it puts council, city council, in the position of having to make a decision without really knowing what the final outcome would be once Transport Canada weighs in. So I'm, I'm going to present some information which was prepared by uh, some experts. Some of them are here in the room today from a group called Transport Action, which are based on no, and given this, this vacuum and this inability to know what Transport Canada is really uh, going to say about all this, this is based on best practices for similar airports around the world and the way they behave and what would likely be best practices in terms of safety for the kind of operation that's proposed. And we don't know for sure what the conclusions will be, but the implications are pretty clear that the marine exclusion zones could be quite substantial. They could have a very significant uh, effect on the Western Gap, could extend right over to Ontario Place, could extend well into Toronto Harbor. And in terms of the approaches, the landing approaches to the airport, um, and the different levels at which planes would come in, and there's precision landing and non-precision landing, and there, there are a lot of technical considerations that go into this, but suffice it to say that at the scale of operation that's being proposed, i.e. the change in kind in this airport, this would have very serious ramifications for landside conditions as well as marine traffic in the harbor out the Western Gap and impacts on all of the population um, along the waterfront. So all of this is well documented, all of it is online. Um, no Jets Toronto uh, has access to all of this on its website. I, I won't belabor this, but I, I, what I want to do now is to actually look, at, uh, look across the waterfront at what the implications would be. And my, the thrust of my argument is that these safety concerns are either being obscured or are, we just don't have sufficient information to really know what the impacts would be. In addition to these, there are obvious traffic, noise, fuel deliveries, contamination issues, uh, which we do know quite a bit about. And so I want to look at a look across the waterfront at a number of areas to see how this plays out. 
So I'm going to look at Bathurst Key, the neighborhood that we're actually in today, uh, that this school is a, is a crucial part of, which is already in the eye of the storm, and is already really under the impact, the current uh, impacts of the airport. I'm going to look at Ontario Place and the Western Gap, uh, which exists since the 1858 storm created Toronto Island. There have been two entrances to the harbor, the Eastern and Western Gaps. And this may be squeezed, the use of that gap may be squeezed up against Ontario Place in a way that makes it unusable for a lot of marine traffic. Um, I'm going to look at the new park that the provincial government is creating in Ontario Place and how it might be affected. Uh, look at the harbor itself and the implications of lowering the ceiling, so to speak, uh, with increase with larger, faster planes, which up to three minutes uh, headways, intervals, and how that would affect the activities in the harbor. And then the water side the water-based activities which we all enjoy in this marvelous blue room on the harbor. And finally, the new frontier, the port lands, uh, what's happening at the mouth of the Don River and all of the plans that have been emerging in recent years. And again, my fundamental argument here is these are not incremental changes. They're not adjustments. What we're looking at is a profound change in kind and scale. And to summarize it, we would be going from an airport on the waterfront to a waterfront in the airport. So let's start with, with Bathurst Key. Um, this is what it looks like on the ground. Um, it is uh, a very special neighborhood, uh, obviously, for the people who live here and have lived here for some time, but also for visitors uh, coming to the Toronto waterfront, it is under enormous stress. And just to appreciate the level of stress, I would invite you, I'm sure you all have, just walk out on the foot of Bathurst Street outside this building and see the level of traffic and activity and the parking and the taxis and so on, which have basically cleaved a great breach right through the heart of this neighborhood. Um, there is a precinct plan uh, which is being developed for the neighborhood. And what the, the findings of the precinct plan is that this neighborhood is also already under enormous stress. And even if the expansion were not permitted, all kinds of remedial actions are needed in order to try and make this neighborhood whole again, never mind the increased pressures that would come with this enormous expansion of the airport. Uh, there is also a transportation challenge here which, with conflicts that are already evident that with the increased volume of access to the airport, um, I think would be, I'm almost tempted to say, insoluble, uh, no matter how much money you were to throw at it. And if you look at the intersection of Lakeshore and Bathurst and Fleet, this is a very, very difficult intersection now. It is dangerous. There are a lot of conflicts between pedestrians, vehicles, cyclists. Imagine the new Loblaws opening up. Imagine all the new condominium development, which is still uh, coming along right surrounding this intersection. And then imagine introducing all this additional traffic into this intersection. Not only uh, buses and cars and taxis, but fuel deliveries, everything else that goes with that. This is a very, very difficult situation. So against this backdrop, what is emerging, and this, this is uh, happening all across this whole area of the waterfront, is a whole pattern of new ways to the water is emerging of uh, people from the surrounding city uh, being connected by trails, by green spaces, um, the new bridge from Stanley Park, uh, which is out for uh, a bid right now, will connect all the way from Christie Pitts down to Carnation Park and down to the water. <coughs> the new neighborhood just to the north of us with the new library, um, the new uh, park at the, the rivers River Mouth Park, which is being created around that library, um, the whole area around Fort York, 
And in fact, what we're discovering is a whole set of new relationships and new resources emerging in this part of the waterfront, all of which would be threatened. Um, this is a plan prepared by Dutai Alsa uh, Hillier. This is a really interesting plan, which shows um, an area around Fort York, the, the new visitor center, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and the Garrison Common. Uh, the Western Foundation has invested in improvements to that whole park area. So, so this shows all of these connections that are emerging, which are new, which are fragile, and which have tremendous potential for the whole western side of the city, leading down the West Toronto Rail Path to this area, all the neighborhoods from the junction, uh, right down through Liberty Village and West Queen West and so on being connected. Um, here's Ontario Place. The province of Ontario has finally come out and said, we're not putting a casino there. We're not um, covering this site with condos. We're going to make this a publicly accessible green area. And they've actually already come up with the funding and designed for a new park on the eastern face, right off the edge of the existing runway, uh, which you see here. Uh, if you move over to the east, um, there is a whole series of initiatives underway, uh, some under the guidance of Waterfront Toronto, some independent of Waterfront Toronto, which are truly remarkable. There, there is nothing else of this scale going on in North America. Uh, there are literally something like $3 billion of construction underway in the form of new neighborhoods uh, in around the Pan Am Athletes Village, uh, the East Bayfront, uh, that whole area of the city is undergoing remarkable change. Um, Villiers Island at the mouth of the Don and the new estuary park, which people have fought for for decades, and finally the environmental assessment um, is approved. This is actually ready to go. The flood proofing, uh, which would make this area both safe from floods, but also able to be developed, the redevelopment of the Unilever site, all of these things are now coming forward. If you shift to the immediate area of Harborfront, after years of efforts, Queen's Key is being transformed. We've all suffered through this endless construction period. Um, in another month or so, we will actually be able to participate in an enormous celebration on Queen's Key when this greenway is finally open to the public. This is truly transformative. But to what end if this is compromised by something which is so out of scale and so incompatible? Harborfront itself, uh, with the creation of the new Canada Square and Ontario Square, the varying of the parking, uh, all of the refurbishing that has taken place in Harborfront has created a destination there are some 17 million people a year <coughs> visiting this area and visiting the Toronto waterfront. This is one of the major attractions in our country. And this is literally, for those who do not have cottages, this and the Toronto Island and all these areas, this is their cottage country. This is what people come to. And you know, just to get a sampling of the kinds of things that are now happening in Harborfront and are possible in Harborfront, <coughs> Imagine that you're sitting there trying to listen to concerts, and I think all of us have had that experience to be constantly interrupted by the sound of planes at frequent intervals. The music garden, which I can see from here, becomes all but unusable as a venue for concerts, which was the intention when Yo Yo Ma collaborated with the city and the landscape designer Julie Maservi worked with our city to develop this. So things like this uh, become very, very difficult. Um, and simply the opportunity to enjoy in peace, in respite from city life, uh, the pleasures of being in Harborfront, literally for all ages. The, the concerts that we're used to, the festivals, the celebrations, this great common ground that we have developed on our waterfront is all put at some risk. For those of us who use the water sheet, canoers, kayakers, um, 
sailboats, dinghies. Um, this is a very, very serious problem. Indeed, it's a safety problem. And that is why so many of the uh, boaters from the various yacht clubs on the island uh, have become so engaged in this. Um, I was lucky enough to be part of the winning team for the new ferry terminal, and uh, Bruno, who will be on the panel, uh, is part of that team. Uh, the whole idea of creating this wonderful new park at Harbor Square and ferry terminal again, is compromised. So the, the rhetorical question that I, I want to put on the table um, is when you consider all of this in the balance, this extraordinary evolution which has been going on, uh, which has been generations in the making, why would we at this point do something which compromises it so profoundly? And I think that's, that's really the question that we have to ask. We also have to look elsewhere and look at other cities to see that they, cities periodically are called upon to make decisions based on profound priorities and shared values. And former Chicago Mayor Daley uh, did just such a thing when he closed down this airport, which, as you can see from the image, has such a strong analogy. Um, it is really about, as I've been stressing, about making connections. And the emerging picture here is so much greater than the sum of the parts. And I think sometimes we don't appreciate that. We're very aware of the trees, but we're not seeing the forest that is emerging here. Uh, my wife, Etty, and I are on the board of Park People. We just came out with a report, which you can download online, called Making Connections. And what that report speaks to, which you see in the diagram on the right, is there is the emergence of this remarkable set of linked projects, east and west and through the heart of the downtown, which are all finding their way to the waterfront. And I just put together this little collage, which shows probably, I would say, most of you in this room have had a hand, the architects and landscape architects have had a hand in one or more of these projects. And they are all adding up to something truly spectacular. And that's, that's really what is in the balance. Um, there have been a couple of attempts in recent years, going back to just after Rob Ford's election in 2010, um, you'll all remember that one of the first things he and his brother tried to do was to hijack the Portlands and come up with this scheme that we all became familiar with where the park disappeared. Instead, we got a, um, a yacht club and a mall and the famous Ferris wheel and the elevated transit system. And what was, what was really interesting is the public in Toronto rose up and said no. We had everything from the University of Toronto, we had civic action, we had major voices in the community who said, no, this is just too important. We can't let this happen. And the impact on city council was so powerful that in the end, the Ford brothers voted against their own proposal. Uh, there, was, there was a unanimous vote at city council to turn this back. Uh, but it took the public to actually get involved. So that was 2011, and just two years later, something similar happened when we had the um, prospect of a mega casino resort, which was going to take over Ontario Place and reach into, uh, take over Exhibition Place and reach into Ontario Place as well. And the same thing happened. Um, and I want to acknowledge Maureen Lynette, who's here, who really played a leading role in another civil society movement, No Casino Toronto, that had the same effect. This too was turned back. So my intention is, and I'm, so you see the two X's 
which marked the spot of two important community victories. I want to link two issues that are on the table now for our city. These are profoundly city-shaping issues. One of them is the decision we will make about the airport expansion. The other is the decision about the gardener. And if we get these right, we will continue to be the envy of the world in terms of progressive thinking and development of this extraordinary resource that nature gave us, which is this marvelous waterfront and all the work that has gone on, the work that many, many of you have contributed to. If we get these wrong, we will squander the opportunity. Thank you very much.